to recall just one occasion in a small, sweltering country town. One woman held up a small bag she'd made from unbleached calico with a drawstring. She said, This is a bag of sand and wildflower seeds. I'm going to plant them with my grandchildren. That's sacred to me. A young bloke produced a bicycle pump. When I'm on my bike with the road ahead, I'm free. I feel real. That's my spirituality. Well, that got a good laugh, but we knew what he meant. A young mother showed a framed photograph of her children in fancy dress. When she stood up to explain, she choked on sudden tears and sat down again, laughing at herself for being overcome by the depth of her feelings for these three gap-toothed junior pirates. Next, a nun who cares for disabled children. Foolishly, I was expecting rosary beads, but out came a wine glass. And she said that enjoying a good red with friends provided her with some life-giving times, which are sacred. A teenager offered a much-handled snapshot of the last time her family was together, before her brother took his life. A man displayed a golf club and explained that for him the moment of hope occurred each Saturday when he teed up on the first hole and everything seemed possible. There were about fifty of us in the hall. Six lazy ceiling fans stirred the air and the atmosphere deepened as we shared these significant fragments of our stories. After everyone who wanted to speak had spoken, I played some peaceful music and we each put our sacred object on a central table draped with a colourful cloth and lit small candles placed among the treasures. Then we sat for a few minutes and reflected with wonder on what we had created. How easy and how touching it was to encounter acquaintances or even strangers at this deeper level and realise that we could relate and have compassion for each other. The table formed a focus for the rest of the day, and this turned out to be such a powerful and unifying process that I introduced it many times across the country. As the day went on, we moved to identifying where we find spiritual sustenance. We heard how wood-turning was good for the soul. Likewise, cooking, meditation, swimming, embroidery, laughing, gazing time out in the shed, singing, friendship, a bit of solitude, or walking across the paddocks with the dogs. One woman recalled the barefoot childhood chore of bringing in the cows for milking and how she would count the stars as they appeared in the twilight until there were too many to keep track of. Another showed the family album she'd saved when her home burned down and spoke of the solace she found in the photographs. One man talked about fishing off the Queensland coast, describing the sea and the night. You could have sanded the floor with his voice, but he was talking poetry. He said the next best thing was when he hosed the sweet corn in his garden, seeing the way the leaves funneled the water right down the plant into the soil. He finished by declaring that he wouldn't be dead for quids. Such rich images emerging from a gathering of us ordinary, allegedly pragmatic Australians. Yet, having spent eight years listening to my countrymen and women on the Search for Meaning radio programs, I wasn't altogether surprised by the response. At the conclusion of each of these days of reflection, I asked for an anonymous written evaluation and for one insight the person would take home. As the months went on, some common themes emerged. Participants said they appreciated making connections, the opportunity to hear other people's stories and to tell something of their own, having time to ponder instead of rushing, talking about what is sacred, a bit of peace, having some time to myself. They enjoyed a nice meal with something real to discuss and the caring and respect of the gathering. The music, candles and poetry took me out of myself, one man wrote. Another liked the lack of dogma and the discovery that we all had something to give to each other. I'm a good listener, one person wrote, but usually no one asks for my story. Today was different, thank you. Among the main insights to take home were 
If we're joyful, our kids learn joy. Everyone's story is valuable. I never realised we all have so much in common. I'm not alone. I need to nurture myself more. It's all right to say no. I can find inner peace. I do have a story myself. Nobody else can live my story. I am unique and I matter. It's good to count the pluses in my life. Life is precious and to be lived to the full. I am responsible for my life, my happiness. And there were also a few who said this reflective activity was just not for them. For me, it was deeply satisfying to see people get together with such enthusiasm and generosity to talk about finding purpose and fulfilment. Even though there were sometimes a few tears shed and suffering disclosed, these were days of trust and a valuable exchange of experience about things that matter. We made ourselves vulnerable, but we were rewarded for taking that risk. I suppose there are very few writers who enjoy so tangible a response to what they've tried to express. It was as though all the thoughts I had explored in solitude burst into animation before my eyes time and again all round the country. I had wanted to offer an invitation to the reader and the listener to value his or her own life story, to believe in it, to find meaning in it, and to strengthen the spirit of it. I wanted the book and the recordings to be a companion to people in their own search, their own struggles, their own joyful discoveries. Above all, I wanted to reassure readers and listeners that they're not alone. As you listen further, you'll understand why. These days of gathering were all I could have hoped for and more. I wish they could have been filmed or somehow recorded as valuable snapshots of our society at the very end of the violent 20th century. It didn't happen, but those of us who took part will remember them as something out of the ordinary, deeply enjoyable, unearthing a hidden spirituality expressed in a uniquely Australian way. I don't do all that travelling and visiting any more. In mid-2000, my father became very ill. I accompanied him through the final hard months of his life, and his ordeal and his death affected me profoundly. It's unbearable to see the suffering of someone you love, and yet you must bear it as they are doing. That's what I'm trying to write about now, in an attempt to find some meaning in it. Suffering and loss and grief come to everyone, now it's my turn, and I'm struggling to find my way through it, as other people do. When I've been in trouble before, writing it down has helped me, so I hope it may work again this time. And I'm still convinced that one of the most authentic gifts I can offer is the description, as honest as I can make it, of my own experience, my own story, because that's the truest thing I know, it's the real thing, not like opinions or theories which can change with fashion or the direction of the wind. Is that why we find other people's life stories so compelling? Because they contain clues about the dilemma of being human, vital clues about how to live the adventure of life. Perhaps that's one of the reasons for the success of ABC TV's Australian Story, which provides a place for people to tell their stories on television. These are people like us being unusually candid as they uncover what lies beneath the surface of their lives. Each narrative is unique, yet it becomes a touchstone for everyone, affirming Carl Jung's belief that what is most personal is most universal. Each individual recounting provides another piece in the grand puzzle of existence because for all our variety, what we have in common is the human condition. In some stories, there's no resolution, yet it's helpful to see how a person copes with going through a tough time because that's real and may well be part of all our lives too. It can be startling to recognise our own situation articulated by a stranger but isn't it also a relief? I like stories about someone overcoming adversity because it shows how that's possible. Sometimes when I'm in trouble myself, 
it's difficult to imagine how I'll get through it. However, becoming too absorbed in other people's stories can be seductive. We might see all those other stories as fascinating and neglect getting on with our own lives. It's useful to learn from each other, but not to idolise, to admire someone else's achievement, to be inspired and encouraged, but not to be overwhelmed by it, thinking that we could never do as well. I know that feeling, and it can be quite incapacitating. Each one of us needs to take responsibility for valuing and living our own story.